On October 21st, 2021, Alec Baldwin was filming a Western movie entitled Rust in Bonanza Creek, New Mexico. Baldwin was rehearsing a scene with director Joel Souza and cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Baldwin was seated in a church practicing a cross draw with a 45 caliber revolver. As Baldwin practiced pulling the weapon from the left side of his body with his right arm, the gun discharged. The bullet struck Helena Hutchins and Joel Souza. Souza survived, but Helena did not. An investigation into what was happening on the set revealed some very shocking circumstances. Investigators say they found six live rounds on the set, including some in a photo with the woman in charge of gun safety, 24-year-old armorer Hannah Gutierrez. Additional live rounds were found in a box marked dummy rounds. So how could this happen? Why did this happen? Tonight, we take a look at the way the gun and ammo was handled with former Dukes of Hazard star, longtime Hollywood actor and director John Schneider as we continue our investigation into the Baldwin movie shooting. I'm Vinnie Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's still baffling uh, and, and shocking that this could actually happen. Something this preventable could happen on a movie set. A movie set where they spend millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. And yeah, this is a lower budget movie, an independent, but you're not doing it for 50,000. I mean, this is like a, this is a production with a super A-lister Alec Baldwin as the star. How could this happen? I mean, doesn't everyone on that set know that a gun is a deadly weapon? I, I, I don't understand it. The more we hear, the more shocking it is. Um, Alec Baldwin himself will face trial. This isn't his trial that we're watching now, but it may be relatively similar to his case, only his case will focus more on the actions of Alec Baldwin, but all the other actions will be relevant, all the things that happened up until that point. But for Alec Baldwin, there's a lot at stake here. This is a homicide case. A homicide case. Death at the hands of another. And prosecutors say it's more than one. It's Alec Baldwin. It's Dave Halls, the assistant director and safety manager who took a deal. And it's Hannah Gutierrez who's on trial right now. And Hannah Gutierrez was literally in charge of the guns. That was her job. Um, she claims she had more responsibilities than just that. She was rolling cowboy cigarettes. Okay, well, that's something to talk about. Why would someone in charge of deadly weapons also be rolling cigarettes on set? That, that makes no sense. That's ridiculous. I don't understand. There, there was like no respect for the weapons and the ammunition. No concept. Like how could you be, how could you be around a gun and not be like, wow, this is a gun. I need to put ammo in that. Make sure they're not live rounds. So another thing has really happened in, 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 as we're watching this case, listening to testimonies, who was really in charge of the safety here? Three people have been charged, but who was really in charge of the safety? You know, was it Dave Hall, who, so, so, Halls who had that, that um, title? Was it Alec Baldwin, who's the executive producer and like the Bigfoot on the set? He's a producer, plus he's the star. And not just like, oh, he's, yeah, he's the star of this. No, he's like a, a major, major star in an independent production. It's like putting an, an elephant in a telephone booth. I mean, that's how big of a star he is, and it's a smaller movie, smaller production. Or is it the one who's in charge of the guns, the 24-year-old Hannah Gutierrez? working as an armorer for the second time. I believe she did a Nicolas Cage movie, first time around. Like, who was really in charge of safety here? I don't think that question's been answered. Obviously, it's gonna be disputed by everyone. Um, and finally, again, we're listening to this testimony. Was any of this normal, what was happening on the set of this movie? Was any of this like, does this happen? We're hearing about prior discharges before the deadly round, like the guns are going off before that on the set. 
I mean, personally, I would think, and, and I don't know, I, I, I'm not in the movie business. You know what I do. I've been doing this for years. But you would think that if one weapon, deadly weapon, was discharged or fired on the set, it'd be like a big red flag. And like everybody would be like, oh, okay, time out. Time out, everyone. We had a live round go off. We've got to double and triple down on our protocols here. And then a second round is discharged. And, and like, like, red flag's not everywhere? I, I, and, 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 it, and then the third is discharged, and it takes the life of a mother. Talented cinematographer, I get it. That's somebody's mom. Very preventable by many different people, including those in charge of this movie. After two, after two guns go off? Are you kidding me? Big day today inside the courtroom. Let's take a look at some of the biggest moments. This is a single action revolver. So that means that the hammer must be manually cocked by the shooter every time that the shooter intends to fire. How many cylinder positions do you have access to uh, when you open that loading gate? Only one at a time. So you must manually rotate the cylinder and continue to load a single cartridge at a time. In order for you to make the gun fire without pulling the trigger, when it was in the full cock position, you had to break it. This is the result as I tested in my laboratory. It would not fire without pulling the trigger in the full cock setting without being broken. You then test fired that weapon 12 times, is that right? As it was 12 times throughout the process, but yes. And you observed uh, when you did that that it had to be fully cocked and that that trigger had to be depressed to fire it, correct? Aside from the hammer being at rest and being struck on a loaded chamber. As we sit here, we don't know what amount of force was required to break that hammer and the in internal parts, correct? That's correct. We do not. Okay. So if there was a question um, whether or not uh, an external force of some type hit that hammer, we don't know from your testing what amount of force that was that would cause that. You are correct. On this box, I de developed 10 latent fingerprints. All right. Um, did you compare the latent prints that you detected uh, on Exhibit 63 to the known prints of any individuals? Yes, I did. Which individuals did you compare those known prints to? I compared these prints to Hannah Gutierrez, Sarah Zachary, David Halls, and Alec Baldwin. And did you find a match? Yes. Who did you find a match for? Two of these latent prints were identified to Hannah Gutierrez. All right. And were you able to find matches to any of the other known samples? No. All right. And were you able to exclude any of the other individuals uh, based on your test? The remaining prints were excluded as being prints from Sarah Zachary, David Halls, and Alec Baldwin. a production company hire an armorer? Um, because they plan to use uh, potentially deadly weapons and ammunition. All right, let's bring in Core TV legal correspondent Kelly Kraft, who is live in Santa Fe, New Mexico tonight, inside that courtroom today. Uh, Kelly, great to see you. Let, let's talk about this Dolly Grip who testified uh, towards the end of the day um, and working on the set with Hannah. Well, hi there, Vinny. The prosecution did say in its opening statement that jurors would be hearing from witnesses who would talk about the defendant's unprofessionalism and sloppiness while she was performing her role as armorer on the movie set Rust. And they certainly did hear about that today from the Dolly Grip. 
He has more than 30 years of experience working on movie sets, and he took the stand today as one of the witnesses for the state, one of the more compelling witnesses for the state, and he described what, what it was like being on that movie set of Rust and what he thought of Hannah Gutierrez's role as the armorer and how she performed her duties. Let's listen to some of his testimony. She wasn't necessarily as... Uh serious or professional as I'm accustomed to with the other armors that I've worked with. What do you mean? Give us an example. Um, I recall walking by her uh, cart a number of times and firearms and or uh, bandoliers or ammo belts being left out on the cart uh, unsecured. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen an armor pull loose ammo out of a fanny pack. And also on the stand, he talked about the armorer's role in regard to where is the armorer when a weapon is pulled out for a scene. And he said in his years of experience, the armorer is always right there when they are going to be doing a scene with a gun. In this particular case, Hannah Gutierrez was not in that makeshift church when the gun went off killing Helena Hutchins, Vinny. Um, just a quick follow-up on that note. This was shot during uh, the COVID time, is that at all come into play here as to an explanation maybe from her why she wasn't in there? That's a good question, Vinny, but no, that has not been discussed. But of course, it was shot during COVID. But we haven't heard any testimony like there was a restriction on the number of people inside that makeshift church. But as we will see, even as you and I continue to talk throughout this case, there weren't a lot of protocols in place. So it's hard to imagine they were doing some restrictions in a room because of COVID. But who knows, that could come out. But I, I don't believe that that's going to be the case, Vinny. Okay, let's get back to this uh, important testimony from the Dolly Grip operator. Um, he talked about other accidental discharges on this set. He certainly did. He talked about two accidental discharges on the set. And when he was describing them, he really testified that they were frightening moments that people were spooked on set. So let's, let's listen to him talk about this first accidental discharge. I think the first one was the, um, I don't know if the prop master was loading or unloading. And let me stop you. What's the prop master's name? Um, Sarah, I think her name was Sarah Zachary. I okay. That was her name. Um, she was, we were, we were outside of the character Rust's cabin, and I don't know if she was loading or unloading a handgun. But um, unannounced to any of the crew, that firearm discharged. So we consider that a negligent discharge. And how did you know it discharged? I was within feet of it, and she seemed pretty spooked when I turned around, and it appeared as though she had um, shot that firearm at her foot. And the Dolly Crip said also on the stand that in his years of experience, he's never known or seen a prop person handle one of these weapons, Vinny. But he had more testimony about the second accidental discharge. Let's listen to that. I believe that um, uh, uh, Hannah was prepping the stunt double in the cabin with that firearm. And uh, again, unannounced to any of us outside the cabin, um, that firearm was discharged. And Ross said on the stand that even after these two accidental discharges, nothing changed, nothing happened. That he went up to David Halls and told him, said he was concerned about some of the safety protocols, the lack of safety protocols, Vinny. He said that he was ignored and that David walked away from him. Wow. Um, and he was he there for the shooting as well? 
Mm -hmm. He was Benny, yes. Yeah, so it's just unbelievable. What they're really saying is that what this witness on the stand talked about was there was this rush. It was chaotic during filming. Rush, rush, rush to get things done. And no one, no one went up to Alec Baldwin. This was something that Jason Bowles talked about on cross and asked the witness on cross-examination. Did anyone confront Alec Baldwin about this rush to get this production done? And he said, no, no one confronted Alec Baldwin. It was as if he was kind of hands off. No one wanted to go up and, and say anything to Alec Baldwin about this rush. Wow. Unreal situation that is being described inside that courtroom. Um, and Alec Baldwin, um, we have a date now for his trial. We certainly do. So July 9th, that was announced today, Vinny. July 9th, jury selection. Then July 10th, that trial is expected to get underway. All right. Kelly Craft, Court TV legal correspondent uh, at the courthouse, covering this day in and day out for us. Thanks so much, Kelly. Appreciate it. Let's bring a special guest joining me in Falls Church, Virginia, former special agent and supervisor for the Department of Homeland Security and author of Out of the Shadows and host of the Protectors podcast, Dr. Jason Piccolo. Uh, Jason, great to see you. Um, this is um, maddening. It has to be mad. Two accidental discharges and, and no protocols, nothing changes. Negligent discharges. I always like to say there's never an accidental discharge. It's someone's negligence. Vinny, this is, I, I, I'm listening to this testimony and having two of them happen. It, it, just, it amazes me. And one of my colleagues brought up her age. Now, listen, you know, I'm prior service military and I've been in law enforcement since I was in my early twenties as well. It doesn't matter if you're 18, 19, 20, you have the same responsibility when it comes to firearms. And as everything can destroy a life, and in this case, it killed someone. But the other thing too is everybody is what they consider a safety officer. So every time a firearm is looked at and it's being handled in a dangerous way, everybody should be able to say, hey, look, it's an unsafe act. So when that grip said, hey, this is unsafe, those words should have been heeded. Let's take a listen. Um to the testimony from, from the Dolly Grip operator describing the shooting itself. I think Joel and uh, Joel, the director, and Alec uh, had some uh, brief conversation back and forth about what the goal was for that shot. And, um, and I think Alec had drawn it once to kind of audition what he thought his action should be um, for uh, Joel. And, um, and then he drew it again and um, it went off. And, uh, you know, instantly, I mean, a, a firearm went off in a small wooden church, so the concussion, ears ringing, that moment of panic in everybody. Um, I think the first person I made eye contact with was, was Helena, who was clearly injured by whatever that gunshot was, that noise we had just heard. And in fact, she was starting to go flush and uh, I think holding her, her right side um, and uh, and then I, I think that Joel uh, let out some sort of uh, scream or, or made some noise that, you know, to indicate he was also injured. Wow. Uh, Dr. Jason Piccolo, you know, we get back to ordinary gun safety rules. Assuming a gun is loaded, don't point it at anyone, don't squeeze the trigger, all of that, none of that is followed here. Um, but it, it's, it's all on a movie set. And, and that's, the, it that's, matter. that's the fine line, I guess, that, that everyone is trying to talk about, that he's just acting, he's just doing you know, you know, his role, he's pretending, and he was told it was cold. It doesn't matter if someone says it's cold 
or whether it's a movie set or not. I'm actually at an advanced firearms instructor course this week, and we were using dummy rounds today. And when the firearms instructor got in front of the class, he ensured that three sets of three sets of separate eyes were on that weapon to make sure that there's no live ammo and the rounds we were using were dummies. Now, yes, this is an advanced course, but still, every time you pick up a real bona fide weapon, firearm, gun, revolver that could kill, you have to treat it with the utmost respect that it can kill. It doesn't matter if it's a cold set, hot set, or whatever. I know. I, I, I keep hearing from all my attorney guests on the show about the actor's exemption from gun safety. Um, well, when we come back, uh, Dr. Jason Piccolo is going to stay with us, and we're going to be joined by an actor, filmmaker, director, has been in the business for many years, burst on the scene in Dukes of Hazard. John Schneider will join us as well as we take a look at what's happening uh, during the course of this trial, plus coming up next hour. <laughs> In Muskegon, Michigan, Shonda Vander Ark starved her special needs son, Timothy, to death. Her other son, Paul, was also charged, but cooperated and testified against his mother. Today, he was sentenced, and the judge was feeling very little sympathy. I don't think you have empathy. I don't think you have any emotion whatsoever. And that's what scares the court. It really scares me. famous actor in a movie set accident that ended in tragedy. I turn and hop the gun, the gun goes off. Now, Alec Baldwin and the film's armorer have both been charged with involuntary manslaughter. Just because it's an accident doesn't mean that it's not criminal. Court TV takes you inside the courtroom as Hannah Gutierrez faces a jury. The Baldwin movie shooting trial. Live coverage weekday mornings. Only on Court TV. <laughs> I'm so sick about this, so sickened by this, that a bullet passed through this girl's body. She's in critical condition in the hospital right now, and I fired the gun. And you, if you don't think I feel really with about that, I do, but the question becomes, if you ask Hannah, did you commingle live bullets? What they, what they call live rounds. When they say live rounds, that's a bullet that a police officer would shoot. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from yeah. in her kid? Yeah. Uh, she commingled live rounds with dummy rounds or movie rounds. There's Alec Baldwin just after the shooting. And, and I think what he's saying there may very well be what happened here. At least that's the prosecution theory. Take a listen to their opening statements. They talk about this mixing of live rounds with dummy rounds and where they all came from. So on November 9th, uh, a couple of weeks after the shooting, the defendant came into the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office uh, for an interview with Corporal Hancock, and she was asked questions about the box of ammunition she was pulling from the day of the uh, incident, this box with the small JS on the label. Uh, the defendant told Corporal Hancock that, the, that she thought this box was kind of peculiar, and she wasn't certain where it came from but she said that she didn't believe it was one of the uh, boxes that was originally brought on set. But then the defendant offered to Corporal Hancock that the day prior to the interview, she had asked her father back home uh, to text her a photograph of the box of 45 long colt dummies that they had at his home. And she texted him, uh, and he texted her this photo in response. It's identical. It's the same box. The box of dummies she was pulling from on the 21st is identical to the box of dummies that her father had at home. So we believe this is more evidence that this box of dummies with the live round in it came from the defendant. It's called circumstantial evidence. All right, Dr. Jason Piccolo is still with us. I would also like to bring in a special guest. On the phone, actor, filmmaker, and musician, John Schneider. Um, John, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, great to have you back on. It's my pleasure. Thank you for, uh, for wanting my opinion. I appreciate it. All right, let me start here with the, the commingling of live rounds and dummy rounds. 
when an armor, where do the dummy rounds on the set of a movie come from? Does, 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 is it up to the armor to grab them from home? Is that kind of normal? Well, I, I'm not an armorer, but I believe what is normal would be for either the armorer to purchase dummy rounds from a prop house uh, or make them themselves uh, at home. But they are always they are always checked uh, multiple, multiple times uh, and certainly multiple times during every day of shooting. So the mystery for me is why why weren't these rounds checked? Um, you know, there are certain protocols in place that keep things like this from happening. And it appears that, that uh, many, if not all, of those protocols were ignored on that particular day. Why is that? And, John, there, there were six live rounds that were found in photographs by police. We're looking at some of them right now. Um, and we heard testimony today that there were two negligent discharges before the fatal one. So... Helena Hutchins is shot on one day, but on, 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 a, on, a, on a prior day, there were two other discharges of live rounds on the set of this movie. In your career, have you ever heard of anything like that ever happening? No. No, I've never heard of anything like that ever happening. But certainly that is uh, that would indicate that protocols would be adhered to even more stringently rather than more lax. So if, if you're on a set where, where um, live rounds or even blanks were shot, were, were fired, discharged from a firearm when, when people thought they were going to be dummy rounds, uh, then you would double down on your protocols. You would not ignore them even more. So there's a lot of, a lot of very strange things we're told to believe here with regard to safety protocols on the set. You know, it's not the wild, wild west on the set. Even if you have a, a plastic toy gun that looks like a real gun, the same protocols are followed. The armorer hands the weapon to the first AD the first, and, and checks it to make sure it's plastic. Usually they, they do a silly thing like bang it on their head. Uh, the first AD then announces that there is a plastic gun on set incapable of firing. If anyone would like to examine it, they do. Uh, and then you get on with the scene. Those protocols are even more strict if you have an actual firearm on the set, even though it's supposedly either empty or loaded with uh, dummy rounds or, in some instances, blanks. And they will, at that point, tell you whether they are quarter loads, half loads, or full loads. I have never in my what, what, gosh, I started in television in 1978. I have never, ever seen, it been on any set where these protocols were not followed, ever. Let's take a listen to um, Hannah Gutierrez in her police interview here, um, talking about really the chain of custody of this gun before it gets to Alec Baldwin. So I loaded it with five of the dummy rounds before lunch. And there was one that wouldn't go in. And so when we got back from lunch, I took the, like, little cleaner guy. I cleaned it out really quick, and I put another dummy in there. When you checked it, it was on set? For mm -hmm. Yeah, it was on set. Um, I didn't really check it too much after lunch, you know, because, because it was already locked up and everything at lunch. But yeah, I checked it and uh, put in that last round. I, I, I went inside to hand him the gun. Oh, he, he was sitting, he was gun. standing in pretty much. Oh, okay. so you, you didn't just hand it and then he walked off. And yeah, then went yeah. So you I handed it to Dave with the camera people there. Okay. So you were close to the door when you handed it. I was, in, I was inside for a second and then I went back out. Dr. Jason Piccolo, um, here she is describing taking a dummy out, cleaning it, putting another one in. I don't know if that's the fatal one or not. Um, your thoughts about not checking and rechecking after lunch? It, you know, lunch, I love lunch, believe me. But, you know, when you come back, you're a little tired. You might not know what's going on. So take all of the bullets out of the firearm, all of the dummies. And in this case, she maybe may have found a live round. But take them all back re-examine them, have someone with you to help you re-examine them, and place them back in the firearm. 
Now, we talked about before, this may be a low budget or lower budgeted thing, but safety is free. It is absolutely free to take a look at those rounds and make sure that they're not live. Uh, John Schneider, are you surprised that when she hands the gun to Halls, who I guess is the first AD, uh, she leaves? Right. No, because her responsibility really, I, I believe, is over at that point. However, what I've experienced every time, and, and we're talking about a Western, so it's a little more difficult because this is a single-action Colt or a single-action Colt replica. Um, what has always happened when I've worked with that particular kind of firearm is the, the armorer or the prop person will, hand, will, will prove the weapon, um, will, will prove the blanks, or I'm sorry, pardon me, will prove the dummy rounds and they will, which means they will fire, actually dry fire the weapon seven times, not six, seven times to prove that they have, they have uh, attempted to fire each and every one of those. In which case they will hand that to the first AD who will uh, do that again in full view of everyone, shooting it, shooting it, aiming it into the dirt, who will then hand it to the actor, in, in my case, me, in which case I will then fire that weapon seven times as well. So there are, there are practices that are tried and true on every set I've ever been in, uh, ever been on, where you must prove the weapon safe. And if there's anyone in the circle of the crew that has any question who would like to examine the firearm, whether it's a real firearm or, like I said earlier, if it's a plastic toy, they have every right to examine that firearm. Let, let me ask you about that, though, John. W would someone be shamed if they're slowing down the production by requiring that? How would how would that play? Uh, no, they would not be shamed, and I'm glad you brought that up because the only time I could imagine on protocol, I'm sorry, that protocol would be ignored on a set would be if someone were rushing them. Uh, uh, Mr. Piccolo mentioned that you don't, uh, you know, you're tired after lunch. So after lunch, the first shot after lunch is never a shot that is rushed. It's the last shot before your time runs out. That shot is rushed. The first shot after lunch is usually very, very uh, relaxed because people are trying to get over having just sat and eaten, you know, spaghetti in the in the <laughs> New Mexico, but. In that case, the only person really, I guess the first AD could have rushed things along, you know, you know, maybe the beginning of the day, um, if they were, if they were still doing the shot that they were doing the last shot before lunch, if that was indeed the next, the first shot after lunch, that means they didn't make the first half of their day. Uh, are you tracking with this? Yeah. So if they didn't make the first half of their day, uh, that means the the last person on camera would be before lunch would be the first person on camera after lunch. Now, as an actor, you have no ability to say, "Come on, let's go, let's move this along." But as a producer, you do. So someone rushed what was happening after lunch and caused people who I believe normally would adhere to protocol because your job depends on it and someone's life may depend on it, there are very few people on that set that could have rushed the, uh, the order of business immediately following lunch. And one of those is Alec Baldwin. Absolutely. John Schneider with us, Dr. Jason Piccolo. They're both staying when we come back. Uh, we'll take a closer look at Alec Baldwin's role in all of this when we return. Arms me, we go to lunch, we come back for lunch, and they hand me the, the revolver, the, the Colt. And they, I just like so mean, it's again. They, they arm me, mm -hmm. and you're assuming, as we've done every time, that it's a cold gun for the rehearsal. That has always bothered me when he says you assume it's it's a it's a cold gun. Like that's not the assumption I don't think you should be making when handling a deadly weapon. But you heard it from Alec Baldwin himself. I want you to listen to, to Dave Halls, because um, he is the, 
Hannah Gutierrez, the armorer, gives the gun to Dave Halls, who's the first AD, and apparently the safety manager for the whole movie, who then gives it to Alec Baldwin. So let's listen to what Dave Halls said in his police interview. Brought me the gun. It was empty at the time. She said, I want, you know, I want to check the gun with you. She did all the things that we just talked about. Then she came back and said, I've put dummy, dummy loads in it, dummy rounds. She opened up the, the hatch and I saw three bullets that all had depressed um, primers. And you only saw the three? Only saw the three. Okay. Do you normally check all of them or what What do you usually do? Should. Okay. You should. And is that what happened this time? No. Okay. Didn't. I don't remember. If she might have spun it, I don't know. But I recall seeing three, three primers depressed. He's being honest. He's in his police interview. He's not trying to cover anything up. Dave Hall's admitting, I only looked at three of them. Three of the six. Um, still with us uh, is John Schneider, actor, filmmaker, and uh, Dr. Jason Piccolo. Uh, John, let me go to you on this. Uh, first thing, sure. what we heard from Alec Baldwin, and it really struck me, and, and I'm interested in your perspective, where he said he was given the gun and he assumed that it was a cold gun. That's a terrible assumption. You would never make that assumption. And he knows better. I've seen the film of him, I think, several days before where he was making sure that even when he was shooting blanks, that there was no one on the uh, on the right side of camera. So he understands protocol by his own by his own words. But I'm wondering, what did Dave mean? Did Dave mean he saw three primers that were depressed and three that weren't? Because if he saw that, then he absolutely should have dry fired that weapon or taken those three uh, three cartridges out that had non-depressed primers. So, or was he saying that there were three, only three rounds in there? That's my real question. Does he mean when she handed him the weapon, there were three in it? And when he handed it to Alec, he didn't check it first and Alec didn't check it. And then when Alec fired the weapon and it killed someone, he handed it back. There were suddenly six cartridges in the gun is that what is that what i'm hearing yeah because if that's it, the case it's kind of where vague, did the right? extra three come from yeah yeah no no one bothered to ask it because and i tell you i called the sheriff there the day after this happened and said look i know i wasn't there but i do understand set protocol with regard to firearms i can tell you what should have happened so you can determine what didn't and uh, we never actually spoke about that. But but so I, I'd love to know what Dave was saying. Were there were there three in there or were there six? And if there were six and three were depressed and three weren't, then by God and all that's holy, he should have he should have remedied that right then and there. Right then and there. there that's going to be are such important many testimony. opportunities for people. There are too many. Pardon me. His, his testimony is still to come in this trial, so we'll hear um, what he has to say uh, in, in total about that issue of what exactly he saw and why he didn't do anything else. But I think you're right, John, all the different hands that it goes through. First, someone's got to bring live rounds onto the set. Then someone's got to somehow load them into a weapon, not knowing you're loading them. And then a second person, and then not check it and recheck it. Then someone else has to not check it. And then you hand it to the person who fires so the it, actor not knowing. Who is, who's assuming. Well, well, but the actor, the actor should also check it. I, don't, I really don't care what, what, uh, what uh, ignorance Alec is claiming. You always check a firearm. And it's not, it's not because you may kill somebody, although that's what happened here. The number one accident you have with a firearm is, especially with a single action Colt, is you pull the hammer back, you forget that you did that, you put it in the holster, and you shoot yourself in the knee or the foot. Usually that happens with a blank. But that's the accident that happens. The, the protection and protocol, it is for the crew, but it's also for the actors so they don't do something stupid 
like shoot themselves in the knee or the foot. So for some reason, Alec Baldwin, uh, for some reason, we're, we're told to believe that the armorer didn't check the weapon. She handed it to the first AD who didn't check the weapon, who handed it to Alec Baldwin, who didn't check the weapon, and then somebody died and somebody was, was, was wounded terribly. It's difficult for me to believe that there's a world, especially on a low-budget film, because believe it or not, on a low-budget film, the people are worried more about their next job, so they want to get everything right. They don't want anything to go wrong. So nothing they're saying to me makes any sense whatsoever. I do not believe in, in any court of law that it should be considered the armorer's fault at all. Dr. Jason Piccolo, um, for Alec Baldwin, and we've seen the, the video of the cross draw from the rehearsal just before, um, to this day, to this moment, I've never heard him say, admit that his finger's on the trigger, but his finger's on the trigger. You know, when you pull it, you know, Mr. Schneider brought up a good point about these 45 Colts. When you pull that hammer back, we mentioned this before, that you a slight touch of that trigger is going to depress the hammer. The hammer is going to go and it's going to fire. I don't believe in accidental discharges. I'd like to see what the ballistics on that weapon were before they broke it, whether or not there could have been an accidental or quote unquote accidental discharge. But I don't believe that. When you pull those things, single action revolvers back and you just touch that trigger a little bit, it's going to fire. Now, the other one of the other cardinal rules of firearm safety is don't point that weapon at anything you don't intend to destroy. And in this case, it doesn't matter. You're using an actual live firearm, a real firearm, not a not a, a prop. You're supposed even though you think it has blanks in it, dummy rounds or anything, don't point it at another human being. Dr. Jason Piccolo, thank you so much. And John Schneider, uh, great to have you back on the program. We'll speak again. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, everybody. You have a wonderful, wonderful evening.